Welcome back to Synthesis Methods. This is section five, the final section of the course, where we'll be talking all about FM synthesis and really FM as the primary method to generating the sound because we have encountered frequency modulation probably half a dozen times so far in this course where we've taken an audible frequency usually it's an oscillator and we've used that as a modulator onto some other parameter um, within the instrument and by definition that is frequency modulation so we'll be getting back to this block diagram a little bit later on but what i want to stress to you right at the start is that frequency modulation fm synthesis the theory of it is not any more difficult to wrap your head around than subtractive, additive, physical modeling. It's just in the practical application where things can get kind of difficult. So that's why for most people, FM is so like unapproachable. But no, it's actually, I think, easier to understand than, say, uh, subtractive. Um, and so for me, that's really kind of the key of this course is getting you to understand these methods. And especially in this section, we'll be talking about how to really kind of still use FM, make it a usable thing for you, uh, especially if you're going for a particular sound. So more on that as the presentation uh, progresses. Most importantly, what you need to know about FM is that it's a digital technology and it has to be a digital technology to work based on the way John Chowning kind of theorized this. You need a tuning system that is perfect. And with analog oscillators, they go in and out of tune all the time. It is not perfect. Um, with modern technology, you know, if you buy like a base station or something, it's really not going to go out of tune unless maybe like you smash it on the ground. Um, it, it might go out of tune a little bit, but with some of the older instruments, they could fluctuate like crazy, especially on the modular, the early modular synths. Keeping those things in tune was a real nightmare. And so it's no coincidence that John Chowning was theorizing FM synthesis in the same year that the Moog modular was released. So where do we really think about like FM in terms of having our own control over it? We think about modular synths because you can take the output of one oscillator and you can patch it into the input of another. That is FM, but it was very difficult to control. And we know what happens when we do that, right? We generate sidebands. We get these additional harmonics. And Chowning was the guy to realize, hey, you know what? If we had like a perfect tuning system, we could work with ratios and so forth. We could actually calculate how those sidebands are working. And that's really the idea with FM synthesis, but you need it to be digital. You need it to be perfect in order to make that work. So he ended up taking this patent. He licensed it to Yamaha in the 70s. And then it was not too long, maybe about 10 years, the technology had to get there um, and still had to be affordable before Yamaha was able to mass produce the now famous or for some people infamous DX7. And just for reference, the Mini Moog was released in, nine, or Mini Moog, excuse me, it was released in 1970. So it's not like FM is something brand new that's springing up um, from some distant, you know, corner of the galaxy. I would argue that you have a bigger difference between like the Buchla modular and the Moog modular than you do the Mini Moog and the DX7. So these things were all kind of being developed at the same time. And we'll talk a little bit about the legacy of the DX7 and why it was advantageous um, to maybe the, you know, uh, subtractive counterpart. So this is an image of the DX7. And what's most interesting about this is if you own one, you can normally pick one up for like under $200. I've seen people trying to charge more. I'm, I'm not really sure why. I don't really think it's justified when you consider what this really is. But it doesn't take up any more space than say your basic MIDI keyboard, your MIDI controller. And that's because in the inside, it's really mostly just like a circuit board. And if you've ever opened up a MIDI uh, keyboard, it's not usually this complicated, but you will see that this is mostly what you have going on underneath the hood. It's not like a modular synth or an analog synth that takes up a lot of space, big parts, um, and so forth. So that's kind of how this is all possible and how it all works. Um, the other thing the DX7 introduced that is a legacy to this day, uh, something that we owe uh, a lot of thanks for, was the system it used for saving 
and storing presets and it used cartridges cartridges known as banks and so you could take bank one you could pull it out put in bank two you suddenly now have 128 different sounds with a purely analog synth you can't like save presets there's no computer chip in there with the dx7 you could very easily do that and you can see here are just three examples of cartridges that you could put into uh, the dx7 and you can actually get these exact sounds um, with an instrument like dext or uh, fm8 by native instruments and we'll be talking about that a lot all right, the legacy of the DX7. This is just putting it mildly. This is arguably the first genuinely affordable synthesizer, and it had over 200,000 units produced. At least that's according to Wikipedia. And when I say genuinely affordable, we often think of the Mini Moog as being the first kind of synth for, for bedroom producers, but it really wasn't. I mean, it still costed you well over a thousand dollars and this was in the 70s so i don't even know with inflation what that would be today but the dx7 was something that a hobbyist an amateur just like a, a weekend warrior type music maker could pick up and that might really get them into synthesis i think that happened to a lot of people um, back in the day the dx7 it's been used on countless hit records of the 80s and many of the famous and maybe not so famous patches are being revived today where you have some of these nostalgic like you know vaporwave synthwave whatever uh, revivals and so the dx7 by the end of the 80s everyone was saying this is like the most cliche thing ever we absolutely hate it but like always with music as time goes on these things get revived and they suddenly come back into vogue the other thing with the dx7 that many people may argue is not a positive was that this was really the precursor to the digital age and that scared a lot of people because just like the subtractive synth and the modular synth was supposed to like perfectly replace the studio orchestra or the um you know whatever the studio musician the dx7 and its presets while they're very kind of reminiscent of acoustic instruments and you can get things that on paper look very similar when you compare the spectrums it's so cold it's so harsh it's so digital it's just perfect waves being generated perfect harmonics and when you think about you know an actual instrument you can study it you can analyze it but you can never get the exact same thing using still a pretty primitive form of synthesis and so you have people listening to this and saying oh my gosh if this is what digital is going to sound like you know, I want to be as far away from that as possible. And as time goes on, you know, things have kind of changed about that. I'd argue that now in the box, you can just get almost as warm sounding mix as being out of the box. But at the time, it was very scary, especially to people who were used to just um, working outside of the box and, and mostly recording acoustic instruments. The DX7 was, you know, the death of, of music or real music. Um, and, and we know how silly that kind of is when we look at it today. All right, so software emulations. There's really only one emulation, I think, that's that's kind of worth getting, and it's free. Um, it's called Dex. You can look it up. We're actually not going to be making sounds in this instrument because it's kind of difficult if you're new to FM synthesis, but if you really get into it, you'll definitely be able to use this one, and it will probably be your go-to. We'll have some more pictures of this as we move on, as well as you know, pure representations of the DX7, you have some software offshoots and things that use FM synthesis, but with a lot more control, flexibility, and ease of use. Uh, the really famous one is, of course, FM8, but then your DAW probably also has a really basic FM synth. You know, Operator and Ableton Live is a very powerful instrument. Uh, there's the one that's in FL Studio that's quite popular. Here in Bitwig, there's the FN4. Um, th again, the theory is very simple, easy to do. And one other thing worth mentioning is because the uh, DX7 is just like a digital instrument, you can load up like perfect presets from that instrument in something like FM7 or in something like DEX. This can actually work as a DX7 um, editor. You can take a patch, load it in, edit it up, send it back over to the DX7, and you can use it in that instrument. That's not something you can do with like analog instruments at all. And it's another reason why you can kind of get the exact sound of this instrument. You don't need to go and like purchase a DX7 to get that sound. You you can get it almost identical um, using these software emulations because it's just a digital technology. All right, here is the premise with frequency modulation. As we've said, FM, 
not something new. You modulate one audible frequency by another audible frequency, and sidebands, aka additional harmonics or partials, those are produced. You can see them in the spectrum analyzer. Basic FM had been experimented with in modular synths and even added as a feature on many analog ones like we've talked about. But analog FM is hard to control. The precision of digital tuning fixes that with, you know, the DX7. And, you know, when you were using analog FM, it could only be used sparingly. You had to really be careful about your tuning if things were to go and start fluctuating one way or the other. But luckily in that signal flow, the FM was normally occurring before the filter. So you're still using that filter as the main tone shaper, whereas with um, FM, you really don't need a filter at all if you are really smart um, and, and know what you're doing. And, you know, there are very few of those people out there, but when you load up presets, you'll hear how that works exactly. Okay, so here's just an example of how you could set up something like excuse me, FM in a modular synth. The annoying thing about this though is the envelope is not attached to the oscillator. So we actually have to go and like, you know, have that extra bit of patching going on. Whereas with an operator, they're combined, the oscillator and the envelope, one in the same. Okay, so here we go. The basic operator, oscillator plus envelope equals operator. That is the big thing to know. Because when you have that control, you can now determine just how much, how deep you're going with the FM. It doesn't have to be all the time. If you need something to be bright just at the beginning on the initial attack and then fade away, you can set up your envelope like that in the modulator and then go into the carrier. Um, and, and, this just, and that's the basics with FM. And you can then take it in all sorts of directions. All right, a couple images of operators. You can see the one from Dext and the one from um, the FM8. And what you see is that you have um, both your quote unquote oscillator, typically it's just a sine wave, and then you have an envelope that's built in and nestled into that. And you can see that what you have the most control over is really the tuning. That's that frequency equals one, and then you could set the ratio to be two, three, whatever, going up the harmonic series, you know, 220, 440, 660, um, 880, and so forth. Hopefully my math there is correct. Uh, the other thing that then is really important with FM is that you need some way of controlling what is doing what? What is modulating and what is carrying and how exactly is that working? So we can see with the DX7 on the left, it had a lot of pre-built algorithms. And if we go all the way back to the image of the DX7, that is what that diagram is at the top. You can see all of those different algorithms. That's sort of what is going to allow you to get maybe a denser sound, something a little bit more light um, and so forth. And with the uh, D or excuse me with the FM8 here you have complete control over that so anything at the bottom that's considered a carrier that is something you're going to hear so in the case of F assuming that's just a sine wave all you're hearing is that sine wave combined with E which is being modulated by D and then you have C coming out which is being modulated by A and B but we could for example take B have that modulate A and then go from A into C and it would give you a, a richer denser sound these are things we will be looking at have no fear but the premise is very simple it, it's not complicated at all once you know the basics of the operator all right in theory and this is sort of what Chowning had kind of uh, theorized and what Yamaha eventually uh, took and made practical is that you can calculate out these sidebands that will be generated and using envelopes control when they're coming in of into the signal and when they're coming out. So if you study like a violin, you could say, ooh, okay, I see how much this is being emphasized. You know, how much is the, the third partial being emphasized? All right, let's, let's generate some of that. Let's use an envelope and so forth. Um, and as I wrote, by studying the spectrums of sounds, it is possible to emulate acoustic instruments, but the realism, uh, varying degrees. Of course, though, that is what gives the DX7 its sort of legendary sound. Um, so you also shouldn't need a filter, assuming you're calculating all of this properly and, and setting up the envelopes. Um, not something that the average man can do. Uh, I certainly can't do it, but there are some really smart people out there who figured that out, and that was often what you were getting on those preset banks. In practice, it is very difficult to emulate real-world sounds um, to, to get them to be really, really precise, which is why we'd use samples, um, and therefore using the presets is often preferred, and nowadays you're using the presets because you want that specific sound.
you could get strings from a multi-sampled library, but it's about getting the DX7 strings, the synthesized strings. And uh, if that fits your music, that's what you want to do. We'll still be able to generate some really awesome sounds um, without you know, trying to emulate real world things. They're just not going to sound like the real thing because they're not. Um, and, and we're just going to kind of experiment and have some fun um, in this section. This is the section where you can kind of kick your feet back and just say, all right, whatever happens, happens. Let's just experiment because uh, that's what I'll be doing and showing you here this week. All right. Looking forward to talking about FM. Um, the DX7 is one of my favorite instruments, no doubt about it. And I love experimenting with it because it's actually not any more difficult than any of the other methods we've looked at thus far. But you can really impress your friends when you say, oh, wow, like I've been uh, <laughs> generating my own FM sounds that, that can really uh, get you some street cred, even if those sounds aren't like the most, uh, you know, realistic thing in the world. But that's not the point of synthesis. So strap in. We're going to have a lot of fun. <laughs> 